Throughout history, the practice of courtship often had particular rules, especially in upper classes. And while we may credit the notion of romantic love to ancient Rome and medieval France, love was not always the basis for dating and marriages. As ideas and expectations about marriage evolved over the centuries, so have the rituals of courtship. Today, we're in a very different place. Online dating apps have risen in importance and a pandemic even halted much in-person dating. People marry, they divorce, they marry again, they date later in life. Today, we see dating take place among all genders, religions, and races. Love knows less boundaries, or does it? How has dating evolved and in what key ways is it for better or for worse? All right, so on this episode of the Insomnicat Show, we are exploring the idea of dating, how it started and how it's going. We'll give you not only the historical background of this practice, but also modern day advice, such as what to look for when you're swiping right in your online dating apps or some telltale signs that you should run before things get too or serious. Swipe, or swipe left. <laughs> or swipe left, yes. We'll also clue you into how to make a relationship work once your courtship phase moves into the more serious zone. All right, Brian. Okay. So what does dating mean to you? Huh? Wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're probably asking, the wrong, have... you're probably asking the wrong person, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, would say, I would say, like, relationships are probably not my <laughs> strong suit. But no, they are, they aren't, you know? So, um, But, uh, yeah, what does dating mean? I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it's interesting when you, when you ask yourself, right? Because there's so many different types of dating. Uh-huh. There really are. Like... <laughs> There's like, okay, is this someone who I'm just hanging out with, having fun with? Is this someone I could see myself with the rest of my life or even for an extended period of time? And I think there's just so many levels of dating. I, I think like to ask what dating means, I don't know. Dating means you're pretty much hanging out with someone, right? On on sort of, well, at least for most people, an exclusive level. But for some people, mm-hmm. it could be like I'm dating, but I'm dating 15 people. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. So, right, it's it's a pretty complicated thing to answer these days. Well, I think if I was going to say logically what it means, it would mean, it, it would kind of mean, okay, I'm going to hang out with these people and see, you know, um, and do different things with them to see if I'd like this to become more serious. Now, that logically is what I would think, but that's not ex- that's not necessarily true. I mean, right. but that's, that, to me, when that's what I associate the word with. Well, I guess here's the thing. Do you see dating, right? There's, in, you know, in most people's, they're seeing someone and then there's mm-hmm. dating someone, right? Mm-hmm. So are we defining dating as going from like, you're sort of casually hanging out, like you may be hanging out with other people, there's no sort of commitment or is dating where you start like a commitment, right? And I don't mean like a lifelong commitment, but a commitment like, hey, it's me and you and we're going like to date, ship, right? Like, like, like right. How we like, where does that where does dating like the word dating sort of find its place well and that's a good point because think about it 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 means all these different things because when you could have um you know you could be married and what do you call it when you and your husband go out for the night like date night right so uh, to me uh, it's kind of the activity right Mm -hmm. it's it there are all these other things that it that could play a role but dating itself to go on a date means Mm -hmm. that uh, we are going to do something together, you and I, and we are going to, you know, spend time together. Everything else is kind of up for discussion and interpretation. Right, because, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting when you really think about it, right? Because, I mean, and a date doesn't necessarily even mean you go anywhere. Some people date night is sitting home and watching a movie together or just spending time watching TV. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that could be date night for some people. You know, we're engaging um, in some activity. You right. exclude like the two of us in this moment. Exactly. Right? I mean, spending, like that's really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so I the 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 uh, I mean, maybe we should look up what the definition is, right? But okay. I mean, it's it's interesting because the concept of dating, when you talk about it, I, I it, it's like one of those words where pretty much whoever you're talking to, it's how they're defining mm-hmm. that that process. Now, imagine if you had no say in who you got to date. Yeah, it'd be pretty insane. Imagine if your mom picked your date. I don't know. But maybe they'd be better. <laughs> maybe they'd be better at it than maybe, I. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so I don't. I don't know. <laughs> 
I hereby really Well, let's be honest. There's a lot of things we don't see about ourselves, right? You know, that other people see sometimes. So uh, maybe in some cases, for some people, it'd be better if someone else chose to maybe to bring the divorce rate down or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, but that, that, you know, I think back and, you know, we're going to hear from a dating historian who talks to us about the history of dating. And, we'll, you know, we'll hear from her in just a moment. But, you know, I think back to dating through history, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, women in particular didn't have as much of a say, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't. Mm -hmm. It was like, you're going to get married because you need to find a husband. And, you know, it's like, you know, a trade and hopefully he's got some money and, you know, right. like, oh, it sucks. Well, well here's, a, here's a question too, right? Does, has dating's purpose changed or end game or whatever you want to call it over time right like think about it you know like originally when you were dating a courtship like historically it was usually like okay is this person we're gonna eventually marry them right and right. right has it changed over time i mean i think that also the purpose in the end game has changed a lot and i've started looking at dating about 300 years ago, because the 18th century is when dating starts to look a bit like dating now. So I think that's kind of the easiest point to go back to in time. So um, the reason for that was it was the Enlightenment in Europe and, and obviously in the West. So people started to talk about uh, the concept of romantic love in a different way. Prior to that, they had thought very much about love being attached to a kind of divine impulse so god being responsible for some of the love you had for other humans and that shifted in the 18th century and people were like actually you can love for love's sake and that's okay and also there was this breakdown of belief in god as well so that didn't really help but um what's really fascinating about the 18th century in europe at least is that um we have this impression that personal ads were a very modern invention but actually in the regency period i.e bridgerton era people were using personal ads to meet each other and um what they would do is they would write these little ads with you know they have like three lines of copy and then they would be placed in these magazines and they would be distributed in the coffee houses and if you were a woman you could place an ad but you couldn't go and see your replies yourself so you ha had to have a trusted male envoy that would collect them for you and bring them back so it would have been quite exciting at the time and they would write things like they'd be very short but you had to get really to the point so it'd be things like um fair and sweet lady of a pleasant demeanor sloping shoulders seeks a gentleman with five thousand a year so it'd be that kind of thing uh so they, yeah like very to the point money obviously mattered because you know who you who you married made a massive difference to your fortune if you were female at that time um and you could request a portrait of someone obviously there were no cameras but you could uh you could request somebody send you a sketch or a drawing of themselves so it it the framework for dating and personal ads starts to appear then and um people started to think as i say more about having a choice about their partner there wasn't a, there wasn't a lot of choice you still had to make a choice based on who your family thought was good for you and who was going to protect your family's wealth but we start to have an, an inkling of the idea of having choice over who you meet and marry so we can see that people started to kind of want a say in their own mm -hmm. love life, right? But I think we should also consider the effects that history and historical events have on dating right. when we, when, mm -hmm. if we're going to look at it historically. I mean, especially big things like we see this so much with war and people get married because they're going off to war and they're making decisions because, you know, life people start realizing life may be a lot shorter than they think it is. And think about, you know, think about World War One, and I know we're going to hear about this next, but, you know, women finally were a bit independent, right? So right. it's funny, how do you go, oh, you can now go to work and do all these things, but hey, you still can't have a say in your own love life. Like, I right. don't know how that's going to work out. Right. Well, something that was really important in the West was the First World War, because uh, up until that point, middle class and upper class women had always had chaperones and quite simply they couldn't have them anymore um, because, you know, the men had all gone to war. There were no kind of like brothers or fathers to kind of to keep an eye on your honour. And most of the women were working in some capacity or volunteering. So uh, and also the other thing that happened was uh, women finally left the home. You know, they they were going into their local communities. They were going into local towns and that travelling facilitated 
than meeting men. So that was the thing that put pay to chaperones. And then after the war, you know, it was the 1920s, it was kind of a halcyon time if you had money, 1930s weren't so good. But again, that shift had happened. So the genie was out the bottle. You couldn't stop women meeting men anymore. And so they did. They did meet them. They went for coffee with them. They went for walks with them. The, when the bicycle became popular, women could kind of cycle off to the beach or have a sort of secret rendezvous with a guy. So all these opportunities for women, women's freedom meant that there was a change to their dating habits and obviously the dating habits of men. So that was that was the really, it was at like the turn of the 20th century, that was really, really significant. Fast, fast forward a bit further on to the 1960s, which obviously we know is a period of great social liberalisation. Um, the 60s mattered because up until about 1964, it was still really common for your date to meet you at your parents' house and therefore to meet your parents for the first time, the first time they took you out. And then after after this period about, yeah, after the, the late 60s, this just didn't happen anymore because people started to move out. They started to live in digs. They started to work in different areas. They started to live with friends. Not lots of them, but it, that was the kind of key period that shifted that. You know, another thing she pointed out uh, there was was really the 60s, right? And I think that mm -hmm. is a pretty cool time too, because I, in my opinion, I think that's when we stop seeing so, I don't know. I mean, yes, we still had this notion of get married, have 2.5 children and a white picket fence, but it kind of changed a lot because, mm -hmm. you know, she talks about, you know, people are moving out. They just don't want to live with their parents. They're kind of rooming together. There's this whole like, you know, love and love and peace movement going on. Right. right. And, and it wasn't well, so much about like, let's get married and have children in a picket fence. Right. Well, it was a very, it was a very, um, you know, it was a very anti-establishment time. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think about it, think about what an establishment is like marriage is sort of one of those things or yeah. even legal marriage right you know i mean look at how it's changed like people are not necessarily you don't need to legally be married to be even considered married anymore mm -hmm. you know there's common law spouses right. so i think what happened is you know and you see but you see how long it takes to shift right because right. that ideal from whatever you know say I'm, you know i'm not a dating expert but from the 20s to the 50s it was you know, okay, get married, have children, have a house. Like those were the set goals where in the 60s and 70s, you saw that change so drastically. Mm -hmm. I just keep thinking about, you know, I, I can't get, I can't shake this idea of like, what about love? Like we talk mm -hmm. about the establishment, right? And mm -hmm. you talk about arranged marriages from, you know, early on. I, I oh, what about love? Like where was the love during this whole time? Yeah which is probably honestly the only thing that really matters anyway in a relationship you go back to sort of like hold on let's think where we go if you go back to plato so ancient greece plato was the first person to do lots of writing about love and thought that you know that phrase your other half that could, that's a platonic idea the idea that you could meet somebody else and they could complete you that's very very old fast forward to the neoplatonic era it's very technical and that's about the 1500s so people in europe decided to kind of resurrect some of those old notions about not being able to live without somebody there was the poet petrarch who was the first romantic poet uh, kind of in europe who started to um create the idea of having someone on a pedestal uh not being able to sleep because you were consumed by love that kind of thing so around that time people start to start to feel less afraid to say that their love is kind of holy or chaste. They get a bit more fruity with their language is probably the best way of putting it and their expression. And it's around that era and then, you know, kind of like going forward the next hundred years, a hundred years after that, that people start to not really think that God is all that. And maybe God shouldn't have that much control over your life and certainly that much control over who you have sex with and who you end up coupled up with. So yeah, that's, that's the kind of break that we see in the West around that time in the 18th century. Um, so all those kind of like deeply held romantic ideas that, yeah, your partner should be your everything. And um, it was about a soul meeting as well as a kind of physical body meeting that was really interesting to people in that time it got resurrected it had a kind of modern sheen on it um i think it was probably in many ways you know less chase than it had been at that point but uh yeah that that's the point when everybody starts to think oh those ancient greeks had a, had a point and then we've kind of you know for hundreds of years been listening to the church too much and maybe we should go about that way so what do you think brian are you happy things aren't like that anymore 
Yes. Yes. I think the idea, the romantic idea of love is, is a nice thing in some ways. Do you know what I mean? But I am glad that all that other stuff is sort of gone. I mean, some people, let, let, let's, let's get real for a second, though. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, and a lot more than probably they want to admit, still get married like this. Mm -hmm. And no, people are not picking your partner for you. Right. But you're still thinking, okay, I have to, you know, follow the, you know, way it's always been. I have to get married. Even if I'm not totally in love with this guy, I'm getting older. My biological mm -hmm. clock is ticking. You know, I'm, I'm now in my thirties. I have to just mm -hmm. get married and, and have a kid and, you know, yeah. buy a house. And well, there's, I mean, there may be no love there. Right. And well, yeah. And I think part part of it is like that for some people right but i think also the other thing you know you know let's go back to what we're talking about with the establishment right it's easier in the school systems if both parents have the same name it's mm -hmm. easier you know what i'm saying so right. regardless of where we think we are as a society mm -hmm. you know people do treat those other relationships right if you're not married and you're the parents of a child and you have them in a school system they may treat you differently than if you were married, right? right? And so we we see things like that, or the government, or how, you know, whatever social security or benefits may work, right? And we see more and more companies and things coming around to, you know, domestic partnerships and things like right. that. But think about it, right? You know, so anyone that's outside of that normal, we're married, right? Mm -hmm. It is slightly harder for them. Yeah. You know, so you see why people go, okay, well, you know what, let's get married. It, it you know, it, life is going to be easy because, you know, society, unfortunately, doesn't make it easy for for people who don't follow that traditional route. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to be honest, just on a side note. So, you know, I wasn't married for the first seven years of my child's life. And I don't think it ever we did have a domestic partnership, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I was, you know, on health and for health insurance reasons. But I got to say, nothing ever came up where I would have needed to be married for any reason. Um, I think, and it's wild because like, sometimes I wondered like, why not? Like when I went to the hospital, I was like, oh, I'm his wife and they let me in. Like no one questioned me, like nobody cared. Nobody like even wondered, you know, it was just- uh, Wait, I you guess, also like, said you were, you also said you were his wife. Think about it. Right. So you already put the premise right. in there I that already you were legally that. married. Right. But if so, I would have said I was his right. something else, probably, and, right. And, and, you know, and how did it work with the schools? You know, you had two different names when you registered him in a public school system. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, so, he, and yeah, where I'm ever quite, like, and you know what? Though, no one's going to question it. Different because mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who keep their name now. There are. Right. Don't you think? I mean, do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. There are people that keep their maiden names. Absolutely. But yeah. I think if push came to shove and you had an issue. Right. Legally, right? totally different story. And you had an issue and mm -hmm. something happened, like you split, right? right. Then right. you start maybe running into issues. Right. So my point yeah. is, like, the systems, the systems gear themselves towards that traditional, right. you know, and we, and we, and, you know, that traditional system that, that, oh, we're legally married right. and this and that. But let's be honest. The slowest changing things are those institutional things, mm -hmm. governments, schools, uh, banks, you know, anything that's like a major institution like that, they have a very slow process of change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're talking about, we saw this happening in the sixties, probably even maybe mm -hmm. in the late fifties, you yeah. started seeing like this bohemian movement. Right? right. And, but you really don't have it being okay until 2010. Mm-hmm. Like think about that. Like yeah, you don't no, go, right. you have companies going, oh, domestic partnerships. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Or same sex marriages, or mm -hmm. whatever it is, or same sex couples, right? That aren't mm -hmm. married, but right. they're you know they've been together forever. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, my uncle and his boyfriend have been together forever. You know, mm -hmm. so but you get my point. Like no one was really acknowledging this for like the longest time. It took fifty years to change. Is my point. So yeah. they're. Those institutional things are very, very slow. Even if we, as a society, right. accept it, right? 
It doesn't and I think mean- we are changing. I Absolutely. think we are. And, Absolutely, you know, I agree. W- when we think about, you know, what what we just heard about, um, you know, kind of like our previous generations looking for a provider, right? Um, mm-hmm. A future parent for their child. And then how we are kind of shifting now to like, okay, well, we want a co-parent or we want an activity partner, right? And like, mm-hmm. we just want a BFF that lives with us, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, like we're changing um what we want. And I think one thing that she pointed out there was that like, sometimes it requires different paths now. And I think that's where, you know, we're, I think that's where we are. But like you said, the, like, there's still this, like, right. I guess, I don't know. Like it's still hanging over your head that like, this is the way And I keep calling it like the establishment, but I don't, I don't know any other word, Right. but, and I think you're bringing up a good point, right? I think what we've learned in society mm-hmm. is it's not just like here's the pattern you need to follow you date someone you get married mm-hmm. you buy a house you have yep. children you get a dog whatever that pattern <laughs> is, right you know we we we've gone when we said okay we're all individuals and we mm-hmm. all have paths and we all have goals and we all mm-hmm. have different ways of getting to the top of the mountain right you know we don't need to all follow the same path mm-hmm. and that is one of the beautiful things about being a human being like you can take a totally different approach to your life than i take to my life and that's okay you know like that's that's nice and i, I do think we have really evolved this side. i think we have some you know ways to go but i think we've evolved as a society with, mm-hmm. with many of these many of these things in relationships. Yeah. And I think the good news is, is that the next generation of daters, I think that we're learning that they want more out of dating than just, you know, um, a, just a, a marriage for the sake of having a marriage to fit the narrative or even just having casual sex all the time. Right. I mean, like they're finding this middle ground, I believe. And from what we mm-hmm. heard when we spoke to, you know, spoke to everyone, I, I think that there are, they want something meaningful. And in America, actually, in the 18th and 19th century, the upper classes could have sex with pretty much whoever they wanted, you know, as long as nobody found out about it and they could be married. So that they had plenty of casual sex and it was sanctified because they were a certain class and they could get away with it. It's always been, uh, you know, society's always looked down on the poorest people having casual sex because, you know, if you go back, you know, through kind of Europe's history, very unpleasant history in the 20th century, people just thought that if we let the poorest people have as much sex and as many children as they want, then we're going to kind of be populated with the wrong people. That's what they believed in eugenics. Um, obviously, hideous, hideous opinion. But, you know, if you if you go back to then kind of like any decade in the 20th century, wartime, for example, everybody had casual sex because they didn't know if they were going to survive the war loads of people had multiple partners in the first world war there are letters from soldiers um to women who are at home saying i know i'm not your only soldier you know they were openly admitting in like 1916 that they knew that everybody was sleeping around so casual sex has been much more common than we think in terms of dating rituals as in when did it start to become the norm that you could just hook up with somebody and then that might slide into dating or not? That is a modern, that's a pair of stat phenomenon. So we're talking like 80s, 90s that that came about. And obviously there's a kind of pushback in lots of ways now that, that much younger people than me don't want to have that kind of casual sex anymore. They want to be much more thoughtful about the people that they have sexual interactions with. So we that might be something that's actually dying out already. In dating, Um, So much has changed in recent years, and we're asking so much more out of love than we ever had before. And, you know, like our parents' generation, we're looking for like a provider and a future parent for their children. And now we're like wanting soulmate love, and we're wanting a a lover and a co-parent and a spiritual partner and an activity partner and a confidant and a best friend and you know, the list goes on and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in order to find that, it requires a very different path than just landing like a hot date. Another huge change in dating has been online dating. And it has gotten so much more complicated, but it lets you get access to a whole bunch of people you may have never met, you know? And, and that's another way where people are really exploring finding, you know, new people to date. You know, I always thought online dating was total bullshit. 
and I thought I was in the majority, <laughs> but uh, according to Pew Research, more than half of Americans, 54%, actually say that relationships that begin on a dating site or app are just as successful as those that begin in person. Well, I think you have to think about it, right? You're at a bar. Let's just say mm -hmm. you meet at a bar or you meet okay. at a supermarket, right? Okay. Pick, pick, you, you pick the scenario. Okay. You pick the scenario. Where are we? Where are we? We are... You know, I don't know where do people meet these days. Let's, let's pick, pick at the pick supermarket. It. I'm at the supermarket. You're at a rodeo. A I don't care. Pick a. <laughs> yes, yes. I met him at a rodeo. Go. All right, so you're at a rodeo, right? You're sitting. You're sitting in an aisle. You uh -huh. know, watching the rodeo, and you see this really sexy cowboy, right? <laughs> down three rows. Okay. You know, you're I'm with staring it. at him. You're like, oh, he's cute, right? Right. You're thinking that. Okay. What's next? Really. What's next is you're hoping he notices you, or maybe you're going to go walk past him, or you're going to make eye right. contact with him. Okay, let's now let's back up to a dating app. So you're okay. on a dating app. Uh huh. You see, you the, see, same someone, <laughs> you see the same cowboy. The same cowboy. You like the way he looks, right? <laughs> What's the thing? Now you got to get his attention, and it's sort of the same concept, right? So it sort of starts at that same principle. And I know it sounds really superficial because I'm talking about the way people look because uh -huh. obviously there's more of that than dating. But let's be honest, you you look at someone a lot of times if you're just meeting them, I mean, don't get me wrong, sometimes you're in a group of friends and you meet someone and they're really funny and you're like, oh, wow, this this is, you know, this is like- And they grow really on you. Great. <laughs> right, and they, and, and, but I'm not, you know, and obviously, you know, part of a relationship is being attracted to someone, let's be honest, for whatever reason physically or their personality or whatever the case is, but you're attracted to that person. If you're not attracted to that person, it's sort of, you know, I mean, I guess there are relationships where people aren't attracted, but I, I don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's one of those things where it starts with that for whatever it is, whether it's physical mm -hmm. and sometimes, I mean, on day naps too, some people have really funny profiles, right? You know, or funny pictures. If they're a funny person, chances are they're going to have a silly picture too. Right. You know, so you can sort of gauge some of it. And I think it's sort of the same thing. You're getting just an initial impression and going, okay, could I be interested in that person or not? And then that's where you go from like maybe whatever, hanging out and having coffee one day and then maybe going for dinner and then, you know, building your relationship or whatever the case is. But mm -hmm. to me, it's sort of the same concept, right? right. Conceptually, it's the same mm -hmm. thing. So whether you're at the rodeo or you're on Tinder, same thing. Wait a minute. I don't know about Tinder. I've heard things. What do you, well, it just depends. It depends on the people, right? Let's be honest. That's, that's any day. We're not talking about plenty of fish. What happened to eHarmony? Well, those are, yeah, those you actually have to pay for. So those are only getting you. Know, right? So any ones you're going to have to get paid for, there probably is. I, I mean, I don't know, but there probably is a difference between people who pay for dating apps and people who use the free ones, right? So people who are using like Tinder and plenty of fish and all the you know, free ones out there versus, you know, eHarmony. I don't even know what some of the other ones are. eHarmony, what, what's another one? Is there even another one? I don't even know. Um, so using some of those other ones that are out there that are paid, is there's probably a different type of person, maybe. Like maybe maybe someone who's paying is more serious. Mm -hmm. Maybe. You know, about trying to filter versus someone who's or using trying to one. murder you and put you in their fridge. <laughs> well, you would want you. Well, if you were a murderer, you'd be on the free one. <laughs> so you would be, you're right. You're right. Right. Good on point, the paid one, point. they would have your credit card information. Ah, so. true, 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 true. Right. See, Brian, you'd make a way better murderer than I would. But well, I don't I don't even know. You just were like, hey, like, oh, I just yeah, thought like he's really committed and he really wanted to find he's committed. Right. <laughs> but you <laughs> think about what you have him committed to. <laughs> you don't have him committed to find a me i'm committed to killing people <laughs> like where's your mind like, what? <laughs> like how does it go from dating to like you know burying people in your backyard in like three Put seconds him in the like, fridge brian get with uh, it i don't know well i don't, I don't know i'm not a murderer so i have no clue <laughs> Well, you know what our matchmaker says that there are benefits to uh dating apps so let's hear from her you know, there's benefits to to both sides, right? There's the benefit to online dating is that you know much more about them, assuming they're honest, which we can't always assume um, about them. We know often, you know, their religion, we know their age, we know the city that they live in. Um, we know all these demographic pieces. We don't often know their energy. We can't feel them per se. Um, when you meet someone in person, you often know the vibe, you know um, if there's chemistry, um, but you often don't know the other pieces. And so, you know, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, 
online dating, you're probably going to meet people that you wouldn't have dated for better or for worse um, in person. Um, in person, especially during a pandemic, it's a little bit harder to meet people. So online can be a great resource. This is actually a really, really good time to be dating right now. Um, it's a little counterintuitive, but you know, after a pandemic that's been you know going on two years, um, you know, when we're faced with our mortality, it tends to shift our priorities, and so a lot of people were either in a relationship when COVID started and aren't any longer. Some people were single before, um, but there's a lot of people who are now looking for a serious relationship that weren't before. And so, um, so it's a really, really good time to be looking for love. So we also chatted with a body language expert and uh, she shared with us a, a little bit of her opinion on dating apps. You know, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I, I don't, I, I shouldn't say because I've never used one. So I really shouldn't have an opinion. I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm just speculating, but I, I could imagine that it's, it's challenging. It's a different challenge because it's not the traditional way, but you know, she says she met her husband online and they're married and he hasn't chopped her up. So, uh, for the average person, I think it's, uh, it leads to a lot of heartbreak. I really do. Um, I met my husband online. Um, and you know, it's just, it's, it's a, you can't get your hopes up, right? And you'd have, and, and that, that's, that's the problem because you don't ever really know. Well, I think also part of the thing is, and it's no different than like, let's just say Instagram, right? Let's just use Instagram. Mm -hmm. You could sort of see someone's personality. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a manufactured personality or, and that's really who they are, or is that, you know, who they are, right? And especially with, I, like, uh, you know, I think most of these dating sites, and once again, I don't know, but allow you to share video now, right? Mm -hmm. So you can actually make video clips of yourself. So it's no different. You're getting some idea, at least your mm -hmm. initial impression. But I mean, here's what I'll say. You don't know anyone until you've known them for three months. Like, then you start seeing people's real personalities. So that's just my opinion on pretty much anyone. So, so. Well, it's funny you mentioned manufactured personalities because when we were talking to Tracy, she actually shared with us from a body language perspective, some of the things she looks for mm -hmm. in those photos that you find on online dating profiles. It, it, I think I think I look a lot with the eyes and the eyebrows in that zone, but also you know if someone has a, a smile that's that's crooked, um, that that can that can say things as well. Like like you you can see if someone's like really smiling versus like because a real smile comes with your eyes and in your like uh, crow's feet right here, and if someone just smiles with their mouth, it's not it's not a, a real smile. And so like there's there's just all these like factors that that come in. Uh, but mostly that's where I land on it. And like I said, I've really tried to pinpoint this so that I can, you know, train people and help help people do this for themselves. And uh, it's been years and I haven't been able to really, <laughs> I haven't been able to really do it. Uh, so anyway, that's my super secret skill that I help my friends with. So Brian, when, um, when Justin and I went on our first date, he took me for a cup of coffee. And I talked for three hours straight. Could you imagine? Would you have like ever called me again? I don't know. Three hours straight. Depends on the relationship, right? Some people are listeners. Some people are talkers. And you got to find a good balance. I don't know. I look back and I think my advice to anyone is don't talk for three hours straight. No. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not. Like, I don't even think he said much. Like, I think, he, oh, yeah. Oh. He's yeah. probably like, this, this, this chick is really self-centered. <laughs> oh, my God. He did. He told me that. So, yes, if you talk about yourself the entire time, you will come off as self-centered. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. But he claims he loved me from day one. So Okay. Well, let's see. Let's see. I hope Let's you know. Up chopped up in the refrigerator. <laughs> well, you know what? You're past the e harmony part, so you're good. I think you're safe at this point. <laughs> Don't say that. Knock on wood. <laughs> so we talked about how dating has changed throughout history and had some fun with the more modern online dating aspects of it. But what happens when you're in a relationship, right? How do you make that work? How do you go and say, okay, we're we're past that point of dating? Mm -hmm right? 
we're in a relationship and all the things that come along with that, because that's a whole other realm. So stay tuned for part two of this episode, where we're going to talk more about um, intentional dating and do's and don'ts and relationships and, you know, male and female communication and all the things that you get to do once you found someone that you plan on actually being in a relationship with. <laughs>